I imagine you know quite a few people who do not believe in God. How do you answer them? Where do you begin? The first thing I want to say is that when you encounter someone who doubts the existence of God, realize that it's not your responsibility to convince them or win the argument. That's the responsibility of the Holy Spirit. Since God is not visible to the human eye, there can be no direct physical proof of him. However, God has provided ample evidence of his existence and character, both in the created world and in the unique nature of human beings. Above all, he's given us a perfect and sufficient revelation of himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Besides these evidences, there's the witness of the Bible, the prophecies God placed there that have come true. And finally, there's the testimony of the church. Today, one quarter of the world's population claim to follow Jesus Christ. Ironically, the church is growing fastest where the persecution and opposition is the most intense. So let's make some observations before we look at uh, Psalm 19, our reading for today. First observation. Because of our fallen nature, it's natural for people to doubt the existence of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 19 says, Since th what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly understood, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Second observation. Strangely, you may think, the Bible does not try and answer that question. God's existence is always assumed. This is because, third observation, the Bible makes plain that no one has ever seen God the Father, therefore visible proof of his existence is not offered. We have neither the physical nor the mental faculties, nor the moral purity to see God and live. Even after a lifetime of following Jesus, our knowledge of God still remains partial and incomplete. The Apostle Paul confesses in 1 Corinthians 13, Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. That's 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. Indeed, Jesus counts the pure in heart as blessed because they will see God. Nevertheless, God has provided many sufficient and impressive proofs of his existence that make denial inexcusable. Let's consider them mentioned in Psalm 19. The first, the universe reflects God's glory. This is Psalm 19 verses 1 to 6. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out to the ends of the world. In the heavens he's pitched a tent for the sun which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. King David grew up with that night sky. It's often his silent companion on the hillsides of Judea. That's why he could speak so eloquently of its beauty and its purpose. In verse 2, Paul uses a vivid expression, pours forth. 
is usually associated with the bubbling action of a spring of water. It describes the way creation, full of variety and vitality, is continually reflecting and revealing more and more of the Creator's mind. A few years back I was uh, in Australia and uh, we went to uh, a, a recreational camp um, in the wilderness basically. It was uh, about 30-40 miles uh, west of Sydney and uh, away from the city lights polluting the night sky the sky was black, the stars were bright. It was an awesome holy feeling imagining the enormous distances in light years which separate us from other galactic systems. Breathing in the beauty of that intricate pattern of each constellation which appear to be fixed and stationary but which like our own solar system are hurtling through space following predetermined invisible routes. It's hard to find words to express the wonder and the majesty which each little speck of light represents. Sometimes I wonder whether God has created the universe this way to keep us in quarantine so that we can't contaminate or pollute other inhabitable solar systems. Now this revelation uh, in Psalm 19, 1 to 6 is silent, but it's crystal clear. A few years back I participated in a Red Nose Day at our local school where I was chair of governors. In one particular class, the teacher, as her contribution to Red Nose Day, remained silent for the whole morning. She didn't raise her voice once. In fact, she didn't say a word. Yet the children were able to understand everything she wanted to communicate just by looking carefully at her expressions and her hand movements. You know, that's what God is doing in creation. But we need to look to discern it. The teaching of creation is not addressed to the ear, but to the eye and to the heart. But many people today fall into one of two errors in their denial of God as they look at creation. First of all, they deny the creator, that's atheism. Or they deify creation, that's idolatry. Let's think about those two one at a time. The first reaction is to deny the Creator, that's atheism. That's very popular in the West. I remember as a teenager, before I became a Christian, looking into that same night sky and feeling very different emotions. Because I was unsure of the existence of a personal infinite creator, I was left with a sense of the smallness of, uh, of mankind, the shortness of life, our insignificance on earth, but also of the earth, tucked away as, as some mediocre little solar system, a backwater way out on the edge of the universe. Without the awareness of an infinite personal creator God, what are people left with when they contemplate the size and the emptiness, the vastness of the universe? We are insignificant, alone, unimportant. The product of matter multiplied by time multiplied by chance. There is simply no alternative. Either we are the creation of an infinite personal creator God or not. We're either a purposeful creation or we have a pointless existence. One of my favourite bands from the 1980s was a band called Chicago. And one of their songs which really gripped me uh, it describes how an atheist might describe the universe. When all the laughter dies in sorrow and the tears have risen to a flood, when all the wars have found a cause in human wisdom and in blood, do you think they'll cry in sadness? Do you think the eye will blink? 
Do you think they'll curse the madness? Do you even think they'll think? When all the great galactic systems sigh to a frozen halt in space, do you think there'll be some remnant of beauty of the human race? Do you think there'll be a vestige or a sniffle or a cosmic tear? Do you think a greater thinking thing will give a damn that man was here? The logical outcome of a universe with God is to answer that no. Denial of God simply leads logically and consistently to despair. What a tragedy that people can look at the wonder and beauty of creation and not be able to smile and say, Thank you, Lord. Charles Spurgeon had a little time for people in this category. He said, He who looks up at the firmament and then writes himself down as an atheist brands himself at the same time as an idiot or a liar. So the first reaction is to deny the Creator. The second reaction is to deify creation. That's idolatry. And we find this uh, typically more in East Asia and other parts of the world. By denying the truth, people inevitably distort the truth. Because worship is universal. There is a a chasm inside our soul that must worship. And if we don't worship the infinite personal creator God revealed in Jesus Christ, we'll worship something else. We must worship something or someone. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. That's why many people will worship creation rather than the Creator. Yet this is no better than denying His existence, because it is ultimately dehumanizing. Paul describes it in Romans 1, verses 21 and 22. Although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Whether it's ancient Greece or Egypt, whether it's uh, contemporary Hinduism, Shintoism, Rastafarianism, people have and always will yearn to worship something or someone, whether living or dead. So the West is no different to the East. Here people speak of Mother Nature or evolution, as if it had a mind and a purpose of its own. Or they delve into astrology, imagining that the stars themselves control our destiny. Science and technology are the secular gods of today. Don't you find it incredible that people will reject the revelation of God, yet they're hooked on programs like the X-Files, fascinated by UFOs or paranormal astrology and the occult. It's sobering to remember just a few years ago when breakfast time television started in the UK, it wasn't the churches they turned to for a thought for the day, but to the new high priests, the astrologers, offering horoscope predictions. Two natural responses to God's revelation and creation. Denial or deification. The denial of a creator God only leads to despair. The deification of creation leads to idolatry. Both lead to a slavery to fear and insecurity. Listen again to how Paul responded to the idolaters of his generation. Acts 17, 24 to 28, his speech at the Areopagus in Athens. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. 
From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. It's Acts 17, 24 to 28. So creation is God's general revelation. The universe is proof that God is there so that those who deny him are foolish. Creation is enough to convince that he is there, but it's insufficient to tell us what God is like or to tell us how we can know him. For that we need further revelation. If the universe reflects God's glory, Psalm 19, 1 to 6, Psalm 19, 7 to 11, the scriptures reveal God's purposes. Let me read you those verses. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are, ra are, are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned, in keeping them and there is great reward. That's Psalm 19, 7 to 11. You see, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is not a philosophy. It's history. It's his story. We believe that God has come into the world. He's muddied up the waters. He's revealed himself in space-time history over thousands of years objectively and authoritatively and provided an inspired, infallible account of his thoughts and actions. It's no accident that the word David uses to describe the Lord changes from El, which is a very general term for God, found in verse 1, to Yahweh, the covenant name of God in verse 7. In fact, that name is used seven times in seven verses, from verse 7 to 14. Why the change? Because it's only through the scriptures that we can truly know what God is like. We do not know everything about God, but what we have been told is true and accurate and sufficient to lead us to him. David is describing how he found the scriptures to be the maker's instructions and therefore why he loved them. He loved them because they showed the way into a personal relationship with the infinite creator God. David could praise God for the scriptures. He describes them as perfect, trustworthy, right, radiant, pure, sure, more precious than gold, sweeter than honey. Now, if that's true of the law of Moses, which is probably all that David had, apart from his own inspired Psalms, how should we respond with the full and complete revelation found in Jesus Christ? Because the heart of the Bible is Jesus, from Genesis to Revelation. In the resurrection encounter with Jesus, Luke tells us in Luke 24, 27, Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. To the religious leaders, Jesus said, you diligently study the scriptures because you think by them you have eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. It's John 5.39 so, if the universe reflects God's glory and the Bible reveals God's purposes, we see in Jesus Christ God's love in action. 
Hebrews chapter 1, 1 to 3. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. That's why Jesus could say to, to Philip in John 14 verse 9, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been with you for so long? Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? You see, ultimately, people come to know God not by hearing about his, our personal subjective experiences or our convincing arguments. They're brought to faith by hearing or reading the historical facts about Jesus Christ and being challenged by the personal implications of his sacrifice, his death on the cross in our place. That's the convicting work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of the unbeliever. John sums it up with his famous verse in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So when someone says to me, I don't believe in God, I give them a copy of Mark's Gospel or Luke. I invite them to read it and answer three questions for themselves. Who is Jesus? Why did Jesus come? What does Jesus demand of me? I encourage them to find answers in the story of Jesus. And then I check in with them again after they've tried to answer those questions. Ultimately, you see, it's not so much of what we are to make of him or what he makes of us. Our problem is not primarily an intellectual one, but a moral one. It's not that we can't believe, but that we won't believe. David picks this up by implication in the third section of the Psalm 19, verses 12 to 14. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You see, God's revelation in creation, God's revelation in scripture, reaching us through our eyes and our ears, burns deep into our consciences. That's why I never try and prove the existence of God to anyone. I tell them they are living proof. If they will only open their eyes to see, their ears to hear, and apply their minds to understand how they feel. David's first response to God's revelation after praise is repentance. Who can discern my errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Verse 12. It is clear that because of the Lord's revelation, David has been brought into a living relationship with God. The whole psalm then is a song of praise to God. It concludes with David offering back to God his very thoughts and his desires. Prompted by that revelation, he offers the Lord his one and only acceptable sacrifice, his heart, his mind, and his will. Notice too that the Lord is not addressed as David's accuser or his judge, but his refuge. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You see, David could, could call himself the Lord's servant because he knew that he belonged to God by the covenant which the Bible reveals and presupposes. Immanuel Kant is not renowned for being light reading, at bedtime especially, but in his book, The Dialectic of Pure and Practical Reason, 
he says something very profound. Quote, Two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe. The starry heavens above and the moral law within. That's pretty close to what David is saying here. It's the combination of God's general witness in creation, his specific revelation in the scriptures, that leads us to feel convicted. Convicted of our sin, our need of a redeemer, our need of a saviour. God willing, it leads us to want to worship him, to know him, to find our way back to the one who created us for this very purpose. To be our friend. So, if someone is asking for proof of the existence of God and they are sincere, God promises to answer in a way that will leave no doubt. Jeremiah 29.13 says, You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Then, indeed, like Thomas, we will be brought to confess, my Lord and my God. Amen.